but I am very excited to be here. And um, let me ask you, uh, in terms of just to get a sense of the room, how many of you are very familiar with polling data and survey research? Okay. And how many are very uh, familiar with big data and uh, data manipulation, uh, or analysis as we call it, but manipulation being the real word? Uh, great. Well, so this will be new for uh, lots of folks, but uh, first of all, uh, what is big data? Well, in the United States, um, where we have no appreciation for anyone's privacy, including our citizens or the head of the German government, um, we are able to collect quite a bit of data on people, uh, whether they like it or not. And um, so we have now massive databases from the government, from the commercial world, uh, from people's own uh, online participation, and of course social media, huge in the United States. From their political behavior, we have a nationwide, uh, we are able to assemble a nationwide voter file and look at uh, what has been, <coughs> not who you voted for, but when you voted over time. And so we now are increasingly using merging of all of that data to inform our strategic decisions, uh, both commercially in business and politically and also in social advocacy. And we are increasingly combining data with up-to-the-minute current attitudinal measures, both quantitative and qualitative, so surveys or also focus groups, one-on-one -on -one interviews, et cetera, uh, to really understand and enrich our understanding of data. So how do you become a good consumer of data, big or small? Uh, well, first of all, you need to know who conducted the poll. You need to know how the sample was drawn. The sampling methodology is really the science of the surveys. And for those of you who know uh, polling or um, data uh, analysis, you know that the, all of the uh, stuff that you do on the back end is only going to be as good as what you started with in the beginning. So everyone in your population needs to have an equal and likely chance of participating uh, and if they don't, um, then uh, you don't have a good sample. And I don't care how much you do on the back end, you're not going to get good results. So, for example, um, in the United States, we now have a huge issue between land phones and cell phones. And um, if we were only to do land phones, we would miss uh, anywhere between 30 to 40 percent of our population which is only using cell phones. And we would disproportionately miss young people, uh, people of color, immigrants, uh, lower income people. The second part of the polling is the questions that you ask. And there's a lot of common sense here. If the question seems biased to you, it probably is. Um, the question wording and the question order are really the art of data analysis and polling. And uh, what we try to guard against is uh, biased wording of questions and biased order of questions, and we'll talk about that uh, more in a moment. So when you assess a poll, you want to ask yourself, who conducted the poll? What's their motivation? What's their reputation? Now, you all ha don't have in Switzerland this tradition that we have in the States of people picking one side or the other. Um, and in the States, it's considered unethical, actually, to work for all parties. Uh, you have to pick one side or the other. Uh, but people often say, well, doesn't that make you biased? But think about it for a moment. Let's say I'm, vo I'm polling for Peter for president, and uh, you may well have asked yourself, have I lost my mind if I'm working for Peter for president? But let's just assume for a moment that I'm uh, working for Peter for president. And I tell Peter he's not going to win. He may be mad at me that I can't figure out how to get him over the top, uh, but at least my polling is accurate. If I tell him he's going to win and he doesn't, I don't work again in my field. So even, if, even though you choose sides, uh, you have no incentive to be inaccurate. In fact, your incentive is completely to be accurate. You want to ask yourself, what's the sample? Uh, of who's being surveyed. Is it all adults? Is it all customers? 
Is it all voters? Is it the attentive public, that third of the public that pays more attention? Is it everyone on social media? Who's the relevant population that we're trying to talk to? Is it everybody who buys food or a particular kind of product? You want to ask yourself, how many days was the poll in the field? And this was a bit of a juggling act. Because if all I did was call in one night, and just the people who picked up the phone, in the United States at least, I would have a survey of grandmothers and teenagers. Because that's who answers the phone in the United States, grandmothers and teenagers. Um, so obviously, I have to give uh, people an equal and likely chance of getting in the survey. So I call back multiple times. I also have to have a way of not just picking the people who are answering the phone, but picking the people within the household. We used to ask people, who's in your household? But now no one will tell you that. So what we, at, what we use in the United States now is what we call the last birthday method. So we ask people, could I speak to the person in your household who most recently had a birthday? And people always get that person for you because they think they won a prize. And my view of it is they did win a prize. They get to do a poll. How exciting is that? Um, but if you conduct a poll for two or three weeks, lots of things could happen in that two or three weeks. So you have to do not too short a time, but not too long a time either. You also want to look at, um, in terms of the sample, not just the overall sample, but the size of the subgroup within the sample that you're looking at. So for example, as counterintuitive as it may seem, uh, 600 people from Switzerland and 600 people from the United States of America have exactly the same error attached to it. But if I'm going to go down and look at a subset, 600 people may let me look at the city of Zurich and still have enough people to look at um, in an unbiased way. But if I want to go look at my hometown of Livingston, Montana, um, so I'd need 6 million people uh, in the United States before I'd get a big enough sample to go down and look at my hometown of Livingston, Montana. So it's important to look at not just what the overall sample size is, but what the size is of the subgroups that you're looking at. Now, people often say, how could 600 people um, have the same error for Switzerland and for the United States? And the way I would, uh, I would uh, explain this to you is to say, think of your favorite soup, the soup your mom always made for you when you were sick, your absolute favorite soup. Did your mom have to, and it, let's say your mom was seeing if it had enough salt in it. Did she have to take half the bowl? half the pot to see if it had enough salt in it? No. Did she have to take, eat a whole bowl? No. She would take a spoon full of the soup, and she would be able to tell whether the soup had enough salt in it or not. That's the same principle with sampling. If sampling is the science, question wording is the art. And um, several things uh, are true. First of all, uh, we always go from general to specific. We always go from questions that don't provide people with a lot of information or priming, as we say, setting of the context, uh, to questions that provide more information. Uh, we would not ask questions that are really biased. So for example, do you support cutting wasteful government spending? Well, who's not going to say yes to that? No, I support wasteful government spending. But do you support cutting spending? Uh, on education, that might be a very different uh, kind of question. Uh, did you vote in 2012? There's a lot of social bias to that. We're supposed to say we voted, right, even though uh, turnout was uh, not that high, at least in the United States. So we would ask a question more like, did you vote in 2012, or like many other people, were you unable to vote that year? So we're saying, listen, it's OK if you uh, didn't vote in 2012. Sometimes it's impossible to get honest answers. So when we ask people in the United States, 
were you willing to vote for an African-American president? Everybody said, oh, yeah, I'm willing to vote for an African-American president. But then we said to people, do you think your friends and neighbors are willing to vote for an African-American president? And either people need new friends in the United States or they were a lot more honest because a third of the people said, no, I don't think my friends and family would vote for an African-American president. I would, but they wouldn't. One of the most important things that we try to figure out in every campaign is who are our targets. And this is one of the things that is particularly important <coughs> in campaigns is to figure out who's our base, who's our persuadable, and who's the other side's base. So our base are the people that are always with us. But increasingly, both commercially and in advocacy campaigns, we spend a lot of time communicating to our base. Why? Because they become brand advocates for us. So we're not trying to convince them uh, to spend more money uh, with us or to vote more for Obama. You can only vote once for him. But we're trying to convince them to take the word to their friends and family. And at least in the United States now, a third of people rely on friends and family for their political information, and 90% of people rely on friends and family for their commercial decisions. One of the things that's interesting about the base is that you often give them information to pass on uh, to other people. So, uh, there's a very interesting marketing story that's told in our business of, do you guys have mayonnaise? You know what mayonnaise is. Yeah, of course you know what mayonnaise is. Of course, we have disgusting mayonnaise. You have good mayonnaise. Uh, but our disgust, uh, the worst of our disgusting mayonnaise is totally artificial mayonnaise called Miracle Whip. They don't even call it mayonnaise because it's not really mayonnaise. It's completely chemical. And 90% um, of Miracle Whip's marketing budget is devoted to what they presumably uh, categorize without irony as super heavy users. Now, Miracle Whip is very high in calories, so who, super heavy users is both a uh, demographic description as well as a behavioral description. And uh, one of the ways in which they really upped um, the use of Miracle Whip in the United States was they sent out a recipe to super heavy users of how to make chocolate cake with mayonnaise. Now this is, of course, must be absolutely abhorrent to the Swiss heart and soul uh, because we weren't even using good chocolate and then we're combining it with mayonnaise. Uh, but uh, people said at first, uh, mayonnaise and chocolate cake, that's disgusting. I don't, I don't even like Miracle Whip, I don't want mayonnaise. But then when people made the cake and they tasted it, they said, wow, this is super moist. How'd you make this cake? And they said, wow, the secret ingredient is mayonnaise. Uh, now, you have to really love Miracle Whip to be promoting that to your friends and family, but it doubled the consumption of Miracle Whip uh, with super moist chocolate cake, um, high calories, no value, uh, and terrible chocolate taste by Swiss standards. Nevertheless, in the American market, it worked extremely well. The second uh, audience that you look for are persuasion voters. Who are the people that aren't with you today that will become, come over to you? Uh, and the people that you want to identify to ignore are the opposition. Now, maybe you want to alienate the opposition because you want to reveal them for who they really are, uh, but you don't want to go target uh, with your product people who absolutely adore. Uh, you don't target for Microsoft products the people who absolutely adore Apple products. Um, these are just some do's and don'ts. Uh, and I think I'm going to skip over these, but you can look at them later. And let's move on to some real-world examples of using data and using surveys and some of these principles in a real-life situation. <coughs> so immigration. Obviously a hot topic in the United States, very hot topic in Switzerland as well. And we were hired to figure out how to engage activists persuade Americans, and alienate the opposition. The opposition was having all too much power in this debate. So we wanted to alienate them, marginalize them. 
by getting them to say radical things that revealed them for who they really were. We did not want to co-opt the opposition. We wanted to alienate and isolate the opposition. So the first thing we did was dial, which are getting moment-to-moment -moment reactions, to the message that was their best language. High fences, wide gates. And you can see on the left-hand side the dials of the people who are the persuadables, the shifters, and our base. The blue are our base. On the right-hand side, you see the opposition, which is the red, and our advocates. <coughs> Not our base, but our advocates, the people that we want to carry the message. Well, this is the opposition's message. And um, it works fairly well with the base, not too well. It's under 50%. Fairly well with the persuadables, well with the opposition, really alienates the activists, as you might expect. It is, after all, their message. We then dialed our traditional message, this um, being tough, fair, and practical. This was the message that our side had developed. The reason we were hired is because originally the activists said, I hate this message. I am not carrying it. I am not taking this message. One, uh, this is not what I believe. This is not why I'm in the movement. And sure enough, you can see on the dials, they're uh, very, going very low in terms of their dialing scores. Our base doesn't like this message very much either. This was supposed to be our message. So the first message we tested was define America. And we had developed this with qualitative research first. America is a nation of values founded on an idea that all men and women are created equal. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all people have rights no matter what they like or where they come from, what they look like or where they come from. So how we treat new immigrants reflects our commitment to the values that define us as Americans. We believe families should stick together, that we should look out for each other, and that hard work should be rewarded. You see, it's not what you look like or where you're born that makes you American. It's how you live your life and what you do that defines you here in this country. That's why all Americans who love this country very much deserve a common sense immigration process, one that includes a roadmap for new Americans who aspire to be citizens. This message, very, very well liked by the persuadables, very well liked by our base. The advocates are loving the message. They're going to definitely take this out. And the opposition alienated by it. And they were alienated from the first word when we said we're all Americans. They go, no, you're not. Some are Americans and some are not. This message um, was very, very successful in isolating the opposition. It generated advocates who would carry the message, and it was still persuadable uh, to people. Now, is this message really true about America? One of the things I loved was all of the uh, early presentations about storytelling. Well, I would also call storytelling mythology uh, because storytelling often reinforces the myths that each country and each culture tells itself about itself. So even though lots of this couldn't be less true, in fact, starting with uh, founded on an idea that all men and women were created equal, actually not. Uh, no women were created equal. No African Americans were created equal. In fact, you had to be a white landowner to be created equal. But that's just messy history. And the great thing about America is they don't know their history and they don't care about history. Um, so history is two years ago. That's as historical as the country gets. So this is the myth that we tell ourselves about ourselves. And people loved it. Now, they also love this language. We hold these truths to be self-evident. Third grade civic education does work occasionally. And people vaguely remember it. Yeah, I kind of remember hearing that somewhere. Um, and again, uh, reinforcing the story of what we tell about ourselves. A second very successful message came out of a workshop, uh, similar to what Peter was talking about and Marcus was talking about, where we brought together people and had them make up the messages. And we asked people the question, how would you explain immigration to a four-year-old? How would you explain immigration to a four-year-old? And people started out by saying, well, people move. That's how you'd start, because you've got to be really simple. It's only a four-year-old. And this message came out of that. The same is true today as it's been throughout history. 
People move to make life better for themselves and their families. It's hard to move, to pack up everything and to go to a new place takes courage. But you do it in order to put food on the table, to provide for your family, and send your kids to a decent school. Immigrant Americans move here for the promise of freedom and opportunity in the country. People move in order to improve life. And we believe that moving to make a better life for your family is one of the best things and one of the hardest things a person can do. One of the values we hold dear to our hearts is a deeply rooted belief in the freedom to be who you want to be, say what you want to say, and go where you want to go. America is supposed to be the land of the free and the home of the brave. That's a good thing, so let's keep it that way. And of course, 73% of Americans do not live in the county in which they were born. So 73% of Americans don't live in the geographic unit that they were born in. It's a very, 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 very mobile society. And so this message resonated, as you can see, <coughs> strongly with the persuadables, the base, our advocates, and alienating the opposition. There are a couple of other messages here, uh, which I won't go into in detail in the interest of time, but we learned a lot in this process also about language. Words matter a lot, and the words that you use can influence the answers that you get. So we learned out of this research, for example, not to use the word undocumented workers. In fact, undocumented workers tested worse than illegal immigrants. The term undocumented workers tested even worse than illegal immigrants. What was the reason for this? Well, Americans said to themselves, God bless Americans, they're a very pragmatic lot. They said, even my 18-year-old has an illegal ID to drink. Now, if they're undocumented, they must be terrorists. Because otherwise, why in the world wouldn't you get an illegal ID just like everybody else in America? Uh, so people thought undocumented had to be super dangerous, like super weird. Like, how could you do that? You would just go get an illegal ID like everybody else. Pathway to citizenship, roadmap to citizenship. One of the things that people in America for a long time believed is, gosh darn it, why don't these immigrants just go to the post office and become a US citizen? And they can mail a letter home at the same time. Well, if you're illegal, uh, if you come to America illegally, as you know, there is no process. There is no line to get in. There is no post office window to go up in and sign up. And so we needed to communicate to people that this process doesn't exist, that we don't have a roadmap, that we don't have uh, a, a future. Uh, do jobs that no one wants, pay taxes. Um, that meant that if you didn't have a job, out immediately. Um, contribute, committed to our country, contribute to our culture. These are broad things that people show over time. The right in our country uses the language, the rule of law. Well, gosh darn it, it I don't care. Uh, if you broke the law, you can't, you can't come in here. Now, this is really highly ironic for Americans, right? Because we were settled by scallywags and draft dodgers and criminals from other countries and people who couldn't make it. So it's highly ironic that Americans are all of a sudden such believers in the rule of law. Uh, but we found that we could counter the rule of law with freedom. Freedom to be who you are, freedom to have your say, freedom's the number one value uh, in American culture. And so we wanted to co-opt that value for ourselves. Let me give you a second example of branding a specific organization, which may be akin to how you would brand a product or an advocacy group. So we work for Civil Legal Aid. Civil Legal Aid is the organization that provides uh, people who can't afford it with legal assistance in our courts. Now, most people have no idea what civil legal aid is. Now, Americans are notorious liars. So 65% of Americans say they go to church every Sunday. I have no idea what church they're in, uh, but that is one hell of a congregation under the radar screen. 45% of Americans say that they give to an environmental organization. Whoever is holding onto that list ought to share it, et cetera, et cetera. So Americans are notorious liars. Uh, people couldn't even lie about civil legal aid. Uh, over a third of Americans said, I have no idea what you're talking about. I can't even make it up. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, so that was the beginning of our message strategy. We also know, and you heard it earlier, and we have a different way of saying it in the States, that when the facts don't fit the frame, 
people don't reject the frame, people reject the facts. So the best example of that in the United States right now, I think, is global warming. 9,999 scientists say that global warming is real. One scientist says that global warming is not real, and Americans say the scientists are divided about global warming. Um, so when the facts don't fit the frame that people have, people don't reject the frame, they reject the facts. So the most important thing when you're marketing to anybody, whether it's a product or an idea or an advocacy organization, is to establish the frame. Powerful frames are rooted in values. <coughs> Values that most people have their entire life. Values that are usually set when people are, uh, you know, in their 20s. Uh, your, your core values are, are set by then. So we found that when it came to civil legal aid, the most powerful value was fairness. People believed fundamentally in fairness. And they thought that the justice system was failing in terms of fairness and that no one in their right mind could navigate the justice system on their own. Um, we also found that one of the things that was really strong for people was this notion of equal justice for all. Now, as many of you know, that's in our Constitution, that's in our, uh, our, our early founding documents, and people think vaguely, yeah, I kind of heard that before, equal justice for all. I think we're supposed to be for that. Um, so fairness and equal justice for all, uh, the strongest notions. Now, we were worried that the message we might develop for the public might not be a message that would be really appealing to lawyers. <coughs> and lawyers are the single biggest funders of civil legal aid. So we couldn't afford to alienate our donors while we were trying to persuade the public to be on our side. So one of the things we wanted to test is to make sure these core values of equal access and equal justice for all and fairness appeal to lawyers, and indeed, uh, it did. So you've all heard, I think, have you guys all heard of the 30-second soundbite? That that's how long you get to persuade people is 30 seconds? Well, in the United States, the 30-second soundbite is now nine seconds. So you get nine seconds to persuade people uh, to be on your side. So try that at home tonight with whatever cause is most sincere to you. Moreover, most swing voters in the United States spend 15 minutes making up their mind about who they're going to vote for for president. So American voters, this must be very reassuring to thoughtful Swiss voters, but American voters make up their mind in 15 minutes who's going to be the leader of all those nuclear weapons and everything else. That's how we got George W. Bush. We should have spent 16 minutes on it, and then I think we would have had George Bush. Um, but uh, we spend 15, swing voters spend 15 minutes making up their mind. So you've got a nine-second soundbite. So we had to figure out what are we going to say in nine seconds to define ourselves. And the strongest thing was civil legal aid assures fairness for all in the justice system, regardless of how much money you have. <coughs> People didn't want civil legal aid to be a program just for poor people. They wanted it to be a program that was available for themselves when, um, if they needed it. And this is a common problem with Americans. Americans don't like targeted programs. They like programs that are for people, all people, if they need it. We did some research on bilingual education. That's education that teaches things simultaneously in Spanish and English so that immigrant children uh, don't get left behind. So Anglo-Americans, white Americans, said, I want my child eligible for bilingual education. Cool. Did your sp kid speak Spanish, though? And they go, no, my kid doesn't speak Spanish. But they saw nothing inconsistent with that. They still wanted to be eligible for bilingual education if bilingual education were going to be funded by their tax dollars. So similarly, uh, saying regardless of how much money you have made people think this is a program that serves everyone, not just uh, certain poor people. <coughs> this is the two-minute soundbite. This is the longer explanation. And it provides a description of what are the programs that are provided in civil legal aid. So we have two ways... <coughs> <coughs> 
excuse me, of expanding explanations usually. <coughs> One is to get into specifics of the program. The other is to get into specifics of who the program helps. There was a time when we always um, put a tragic face on every single cause. Well, Americans get kind of sick of all those tragic cases. And now, usually, instead of fixing the system, they try to fix the people. So we are doing a campaign in the United States right now to increase the minimum wage. And we showed a single mom with two kids who works full time and can't make it. But when we tested that story, people said, uh, well, she shouldn't have had those kids she can't afford. Uh, and then they said, well, she shouldn't have dropped out of school. Who said she dropped out of school? We just said she's working minimum wage. Then they said, she shouldn't be on drugs. I said, who said she was on drugs? She can't afford drugs. She's making minimum wage. Um, so people, you can see, trying to fix the person, not the system. When we said instead in our messaging that two-thirds of the people in minimum wage, making minimum wage income are women and that the minimum wage is $290 a week, then people said, damn, nobody can make that. Nobody can live on that. Uh, so it turns out in the United States, at least right now, tragic cases are often less persuasive than the specifics of the program. And that was true in civil legal aid as well. But we had this constant concern in this branding about the fact that we had um, <coughs> a case study of, we had these lawyers that we had to keep happy and keep funding us, as well as average people that we wanted to support civil legal aid because we wanted to get more funding from government. And so we also developed this message which was a more direct appeal to a constituency. This might be the people who are already buying your product or the highest income people who are buying your product or the people who are your advocates for your organization. And here it talked more about the necessity for civil legal aid. They liked the general message, but they also liked the direct appeal. Um, the last thing I want to show you is just, um, so this is all polling. This is actually small data. What do we do to match this to big data? So what we are doing increasingly in the United States is matching small data, the polls that we're doing, uh, to analysis of big data. Uh, the the uh, behavior over time, the information that we have about people's consumer behavior, the information that we have about their political behavior, the information that we have uh, about their advocacy behavior. And many, as I understand it, having spent a little time here now, we have access to many, many, many lists that you guys do not have. So one of the things we had access to is, uh, for example, um, we did a campaign for marriage equality, gay marriage, in Maine. And Maine has what we call a vanity license plate. For a little extra money, you can buy a license plate with loons on it. Loons are geese, wild geese, and support conservation in Maine. Well, obviously, that's a great way to identify a group of environmentalists. Anybody who's going to spend a little extra money for loons on their plate <coughs> is probably an environmentalist. But we found out that buying a loon license plate was also one of the highest correlations with being for marriage equality. Um, because environmentalists in general, more educated, people who are spending a little extra money for their license plate usually have a little bit more money, and that's upscale. The people who like the vanity license plate were younger. So lots of reasons. We found that out by taking the survey data and matching it with everything we had available on the people of Maine. Their commercial behavior, their political behavior, uh, their advocacy behavior. And then we looked at who were our supporters and who were the swing and uh, what correlated or what was associated with that. Similarly, we did the same thing in the U.S. Senate races and in the Obama race, doing massive surveys and then looking at what are uh, the correlates of behavior. And what you see here, we were able to divide people based on their other behavior into five quintiles. 
five different subgroups. And you can see here the survey results are the dark orange, the light orange is the Democratic candidate model. And what we're showing here is that it's pretty darn accurate, that the people that have the highest fifth of scores are the people that indeed are the most supportive of our candidate according to the model. And the people that have the lowest scores are the least supportive of the candidate. You still have to have survey data to do the modeling, but it means I only have to interview a couple thousand people instead of 250 million people to figure out where everybody is on this uh, kind of dimension. Let me move away uh, forward now, and you can get all of these slides to key takeaways. So the first thing um, in terms of big data, small data, quantitative data, qualitative data, is you have to know <coughs> what you want to find out. And that's where the kind of uh, thinking in workshops that Peter and Marcus and others talked about are so important. Your, there's no quick way uh, to do big data analysis. Your uh, analysis is only going to be as good as the time you invest on the early end in figuring out what you want to ask, how you want to ask it in an unbiased and balanced way, how you, who you want to ask it of, what is the correct population, and what can I do to assemble the best list possible to reach that population so that everybody in that population has an equal and likely chance of getting in the survey. Then uh, you conduct your survey, you conduct your modeling, and you look at the back end. And there are two other questions that you ask yourself. One is, does this make sense? Um, apply the common sense test. If um, you really uh, thought that um, you were winning uh, a campaign, uh, if, if you had research that told you everybody in America wanted to buy your product, and you're not tied, uh, detergent, uh, then you probably got a faulty sample. Something's wrong with that research. Similarly, if you had research that said everybody in America hated Barack Obama, well, there are a lot of people in America who hated Barack Obama, but not everybody. Uh, so again, you probably got a faulty sample, and you want to go back and check where did things fall wrong. Your research is accurate uh, only 95 times out of 100. So five times you're going to get the wrong results, and you want to go back and check that. It's also only absolutely accurate for the moment that you took that survey. That's what keeps people like me in business, because what do you need to do? More research. Um, when do you need to do it? Often. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, and again, I apologize for this horrible cold, and I look forward to taking your questions and comments. <laughs>